In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus says, which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Now, that line makes pretty good sense, right? We all understand that we need to estimate cost and expense in order to make sure that we have enough of whatever we need in order to do the thing that we want to do. Seems like we totally get this idea that Jesus is putting forward today. We know how much houses cost before we sign away our life. We know how much cars cost. We know how much tuition costs, how much a suit costs, and on and on. We get cost, and we understand, at least in a shallow way, that kind of cost-benefit analysis that Jesus is pointing to today. I mean, I don't believe it's a stretch to say that we evaluate cost more times in a week or a month than we can even number. And so I think it's very interesting that the only time the word cost, this idea, the price of a task, is used in the entire New Testament is in this line right here in the Gospel of Luke. The idea of cost, how much something is, the value of a task, is something that Jesus implies a lot but only it says explicitly right here. Today, Jesus is talking about the cost of discipleship. I think it's safe to say that Jesus was very aware of the cost of his ministry. Jesus was aware of the expense of his faithfulness. And at nearly every turn, Jesus seeks to teach or remind his followers that responding to God, following him, is kind of expensive. That following him costs a lot. Now, following Jesus is definitely not cheap. Following Jesus is definitely not easy. But following Jesus is actually quite simple. I believe the point of the gospel, indeed, the point of Jesus' presence here on earth, can be summed up quite simply. God loves you, and God wants you to love him back. Not just some of us sometimes, but all of us all the time. I believe deep down in our bones, we want to do just that. We want to love God back. We want to love one another like we know we are loved by God, but we struggle to do the small things that create the habits that transform us into the disciples we want to be. A few weeks ago, I preached on a passage that was similar very much to the one that we heard read today. And I spoke about doing small acts of big love. Well, after church that Sunday, a family here at St. Michael went home, and just about a couple hours after they got home, they were cleaning up lunch, there was a knock at the door. And they went to the door to see who was there, and there were two teenage kids, a brother and sister who introduced themselves as not living in the neighborhood, but who wanted to come and read a passage from Scripture to them. And they said, okay. And so the kids looked at them and said, you know, bad things have happened recently in the world, and it seems like the world might be a bad place, but we wanted to go around and remind people that everything's going to be okay, that God is with us. And so they said, yes, please. And so these two kids read a passage from Romans. There was no ask. They did not tell them they were from a certain church. They simply said, God loves you and left. And this family was so touched by this that these kids would just walk through the neighborhood reminding people that they're loved and that everything's going to be okay. You know, I hear a story like this and I think that most of us struggle with doing small things. You know, doing small things sounds good and all, but we, we are very able people and we are mostly successful people. And I think that when you are very able and when you've had some success in life, it's very tempting to think if you don't do a big thing, you're not doing enough. Small things almost seem too small to worry about. And yet, those small things done with generosity and love are what actually can make the biggest impact. Today we begin a new series on grace. 
And grace is the kind of idea that sounds really good. It's a small thing that can make a huge difference to us. But what really is grace? How do we recognize grace in the world? You might remember that last week I introduced the idea of tracking little moments of grace in these little books that I'm going to talk about in just one second. I took these books home last week and I sat down with my own kids and I said, okay, so we're going to start thinking about moments of grace. And they looked at me and said, well, what's that? And I said, well, you, grace, right? Grace. And I thought, well, I'm not entirely sure how to describe grace. And if I'm struggling to actually describe grace, I'm thinking you might need some help too. So we're going to talk about what grace actually is. Grace, put simply, is the moment when we experience the real presence of God. That sounds like a big thing, and it is, which means that grace for each person is a little unique. But if we flesh this out a little bit more, grace actually occurs in two parts. The first part has nothing to do with us. Grace is poured out freely upon us by God. Grace cannot be manufactured. Grace cannot be forced. Grace cannot be contained. The second part of grace has everything to do with us. Grace is most powerful when we are ready and willing to receive that gift from God. When we open ourselves up, when we are vulnerable and authentic and aware of what God is doing in the world, then we begin to be vessels of that grace. And those small ripples begin to affect everything around us and transform not only us from the inside out, but the world, the people, our family, our friends. You see, grace is powerful. The power of grace to transform us into the people we want to be is huge. Now, over these next few weeks, even actually a few months, we're going to be talking more about grace. But for today, I want to make sure you know you are invited to begin this journey with us. We have little books for everybody, not just you, but for your kids, for your family, for your friends. We want you to take these and inside these books every day, mark down one little moment in which you have experienced the real presence of God. It can be a gift received and it can be a moment when you realize you have been that gift to others, even if you were unaware. See, grace is something unique to every person. Grace is God's love that manifests itself in our world, and it can take many forms. But being aware of grace is critical. As we mark down these moments of grace, first I want to say, actually do it. In fact, how many of you have actually done it this past week? Come on, get credit. Yeah, I see some hands. Well done. They're ahead of you. So grab your books, start making these moments of grace a real thing. Start marking down the moments when you experience God because we know we do. We know we have these moments when God is gifting us and blessing us and when we then can bless others. By writing these moments down, by helping each other identify these moments, we will begin to learn that the cost of discipleship is an expense that we can truly make. We will be transformed by God's grace as we create the small habits that ripple out into big love to transform the world. Amen.